Web 2.0. Innovation. Trend. Collaboration. Metadata. Software. Metadata. Got the world turning as fast as it can? Hear how technology can help, legally speaking, with two of the top legal technology experts, authors, and lawyers, Dennis Kennedy and Tom Mile. Welcome to the Kennedy Mile Report here on the Legal Talk Network. And welcome to episode 241 of the Kennedy Mile Report. I'm Dennis Kennedy in Ann Arbor. And I'm Tom Mile in Dallas. Before we get started, we'd like to thank our sponsors. Thanks first to Text Expander for sponsoring our show. Communicate smarter with Text Expander. Gather, perfect, and share your knowledge. Recall your best words instantly and repeatedly. Learn more at textexpander.com forward slash podcast. And we'd also like to thank ServeNow, a nationwide network of trusted, pre-screened process servers. Work with the most professional process servers who have experience with high-volume serves, embrace technology, and understand the litigation process. Visit servenow.com to learn more. In our last episode, we discussed our highlights from Mary Meeker's 2019 State of the Internet report. In this episode, we do one of our periodic shows where one of us really kind of wants to learn from the other about uh, what the other person is doing, and we do it as an interview show. For example, I once uh, interviewed Tom about change management, so I could learn a little bit more about that topic. So I've been talking with Tom for a while about the idea of personal quarterly offsites, and Tom wanted to learn more about what I do when I do those. I've actually heard from quite a few people who are interested in this approach and want to learn more themselves uh, and how they might hold their own personal quarterly offsite. Tom, what's all on our agenda for this episode? Well, Dennis, in this edition of the Kennedy Mall Report, we will indeed be discussing the concept of the personal quarterly offsite, uh, and I'll be asking all the questions. Uh, In our second segment, it's vacation time, and we'll talk about some of our newest tips and tools for travel. And as usual, we'll we'll finish up with our parting shots, that one tip, website, or observation that you can start to use the second that this podcast is over. But first up, personal quarterly offsites. I think uh, we are probably all familiar with the idea of a company or a firm offsite meeting, usually once a year, heading to a non-work location to sit down, Revisit what happened the past year, look at the year to come, do some team building, make plans, those types of things. My company usually has ours in January when our clients are all away for the holidays. Uh, but Dennis, you've been conducting your own type of offsite, the personal quarterly offsite for a while now, which is, I think, a little bit different from what most companies and law firms do. Uh, by the calendar on my iPad Pro, I see that we're recording at the beginning of a calendar quarter. So, Dennis, does that mean? that you just held a personal quarterly offsite? Yes, it does. I just finished one a couple of days ago with some unexpected results for me, but uh, but I think it's a good example of uh, the approach that I take. And so uh, it'll be interesting to discuss with you. So let's, I guess, start with the basics. What do you mean and what do you, what, what do you call a personal quarterly offsite? Well, I think you're right, Tom, in what you're saying. If you look at what companies do, and this is sort of the, the concept, that companies do this thing, and, and could be annual, could be quarterly, and there's a couple of, important, uh, you know, couple of things that are important to it. So one, it is off-site, so, you, so you're free from inter- work interruptions and excuses to kind of drift away from the off-site. There's usually a, a pretty serious agenda, so it could be reviewing plans, it could be making plans for the future, could be focused on on education, uh, maybe bring in some guest speakers, you might do some design thinking, you might do other things, but there's a, a structure to it. And I guess the difference probably between the company offsite or firm offsite and a personal offsite is that you're typically not doing team building exercises because it's just you. Where'd you get the idea for this? How did this come onto your radar? Did you come up with it by yourself or uh, did you get inspiration from it? How did it happen? I learned about it through uh, a book by a, a guy named Greg McKeown, and it's called Essentialism. And there's a little mention of it in the book, and he's talked about it in other places. And I saw some people had picked it up. And I, I just love the idea because it gives you that chance to kind of step away and do these things that you would like to do. And you always mean to get around to do it. 
doing, um, but you you find that you're too busy or you're too tired or whatever to actually pay attention to what's going on with yourself. And so that's what uh, inspired me to try it. And I was so pleased with the initial results. I've just made it probably for the last few years, maybe three, four, at least years I've been doing on a quarterly basis. So tell me, uh, I think in general, what is the benefit of the personal quarterly, quarterly outfit? How have they helped you in you know making decisions about what you're going to be doing. When I look back at a lot of the major moves in my life in the last few years, and time you're aware, there there have been several major ones um, that I, I've used the offside to kind of help me plan for those and, and to look at those. So I try to to uh, put a little structure into it. So part of the offsides for me are kind of in the design thinking, uh, brainstorming thing. I sometimes use the offsides to uh, just pull ideas out of my head and get them on paper to kind of clear up some space. I do some things where I'm planning goals for the next year, sometimes reviewing what's happened recently, looking at uh, the focus of, of what I'm doing. I've also do- tried doing some things where I spend a day maybe looking at, uh, say, webcasts or other things on a certain topic in the same way you did in, uh, in an offsite where somebody might, you know, your company might bring in a guest speaker. So it sounds like that occasionally you might have a theme or a set topic for that. I mean, what what drives that? What makes you decide that you, do you have it every time? Is it just as the mood strikes you? How does that work? Well, I try to be thematic. There are a couple things that I, I do um, each time. And so, so there's some questions I take a look at. There's also uh, something I think you're familiar with this time. It's the start, continue, stop exercise, or sometimes it's start, continue and do more of, continue and do less of, and stop, which is kind of taking a look at all the projects you're involved in and seeing which ones still make sense. So there's some things that kind of carry through, but then then I usually try to say, okay, if at this time of year, I might do uh, one thing or another. So I, to me, obviously, at the end of the year, I do a combination of taking uh, a look at the past year and then looking forward to the next year. Then usually halfway through the year, you take a look to see how things are going. Sometimes, and sometimes in September, uh, you might look at how revenues are going or, or a specific focus. And in the spring, you might take a look to say, okay, here's some projects or new things I want to start. So I, I will shift around themes like that and vary with time. But sort of, I try to do something different each quarter. So when you, no matter what quarter it is, what's the end result? Do you have deliverables? Do you have results that you can point to things that you can say, here's, you know, here's what I accomplished uh, as as part of the, I don't don't know if that's, you're looking at deliverables as part of your last quarter or what you plan on this quarter or how that works. What, how do you measure what you're doing? So what I like to do is to, um, by the end of it, say, okay, I've got all these ideas out of my head, um, and I've kind of prioritized some things, and I've decided that some things are more important than others, and some can be either eliminated or moved to to a later point. So I have a little bit more clarity of focus, and then I'm able to take some of those things and actually turn them into projects and to dos with with time frames on it and that to me is is really significant because sometimes I just am spread too thin and, and doing too much and so that that ability to focus is a big thing but I think it's more to say okay out of this you know one two or three things will happen and I'll, I'll give you one example Tom is that at the first of the, well, actually, it was last, last fall, I said, well, here are all these things I want to do. And there's a big, long list. And I said, I'm, I need to get this list down to at least three. And I actually 
kind of came up with this notion, which uh, now I call the think tank notion or the, the Kennedy idea propulsion laboratory, as I've called it, that actually kind of slimmed the things I was thinking about into one very understandable to me approach going forward with most of the projects and what I would call the business that I'll be doing um, going forward. And so that was tremendously helpful. And I don't know, and I was, I had just spent months and, and I probably bored you with my, my thinking aloud about this time, but I just spent months trying to figure that out, like how to slim things down. And then that actually, as a result of the offside, I came up with sort of like one umbrella approach that really works, really started to work well for me. Okay, so we we kind of have an idea of what what a deliverable might look like for you, what 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 it has been. We've kind of talked about this in conceptual terms. Maybe let's get real and um, and say you just finished one last week. Tell us what it looked like. What did you do? How did it take place? So what I like to do is I, I really focus on this notion of offsite, but I also try to make it simple. So what I found is that it's a, about a 15 minute walk f from my apartment to the library. And the library is, is really well suited for, for what I'm trying to do, as long as you know you realize there are going to be other people there. So it's sort of the walking is an important part of me, and then having an agenda, and then also what I would say priming the pump. So I know ahead of time the things I'm going to be thinking about I might have done like a little pre bit of pre-read, but I'm kind of getting prime, the walking over to the library is that, and then I had sort of like, you know, one mind mapping, big mind mapping session on looking at revenues. The second was to take, and it was really a design thinking approach. So I just put, I got out all the ideas I could, then I prioritized them and grouped them or grouped and prioritized, I guess this is a better way to do it, to go forward. And then, then I had three smaller issues that I would kind of want to take some time to, to think at and think about, and, and that's what I did. So it was sort of me with a, you love this time, I actually used the uh, my rocket book for this, but it's sort of like me with mind maps and a, and uh, you know a pen and paper to uh, to do this going forward. If I was in a different setting, I probably it's the type of thing you might have done with post-it notes. But but in the setting I was at, the mind mapping was the right approach for this offsite. So no technology, it's all got to be handwritten. I like doing the handwritten thing for this one. That's not always the case. Sometimes you do want to work with spreadsheets or other things. The main technology, uh, I try to stay away from technology, so no interruptions. Um, I would say I use the technology basically to, to be on Spotify. Okay. So one of the things you just said was that the walk is important, and it sounds to me like um, – Part of the reason for the walk is to prime the pump, to get you thinking. I, I notice when I'm having trouble thinking about something that just walking my dogs can help me work through things. And it's just kind of a magical experience just being out there and letting my mind go. Is that the same sort of thing? Is that why walkability or walking to this is an important thing for you? Yes, that. And the other thing is that I think if you drive to something, you get sort of tensed up about driving and getting to the place and that whole experience kind of throws you off a little bit. So I've actually, I tried an offsite of uh, personal quarterly offsite with a very long walk, like a couple hour walk. Um, and it's, and that actually was really good. Although it is frankly really hard to kind of capture what it is that you're thinking about. So you have to remember that I've sometimes just gone for a long bike ride before I do the, uh, the offsite. But I think there is that, I think the walking thing is really good. Cause as you say, Tom, there is something about us that when we walk and we're thinking without interruption, and we kind of primed the pump, it gets you more in the mood to say, okay, I'm ready to get some things out. You'd mentioned earlier, you said that the only technology that you generally use is Spotify. And um, I'm a little curious by that. Is it is it mostly that you're listening to music when this happens? Does music play a role in how you conduct this? Yeah, although I tend to think of it in the sense of soundscapes, and I've talked about it on this uh, this on the podcast a couple of times. But so 
There's a number of things that didn't go right for me this weekend when I was uh, going to uh, do the offsite. I overslept a little bit. I was a little harried getting out the door, you know, that sort of thing. And um, I struggled at the beginning when I wasn't playing any music, which just getting things out of my head onto a mind map. But once I picked a playlist that was... Uh, I think I just picked one that was ambient creativity. It was really interesting how in a few minutes and for the rest of the morning, it was just super easy for for me to get the ideas out. And I attribute that a bit to the to soundscape. Now, I was doing some writing today, and I used the same playlist, and it didn't wor- did not work as well for me. I had to switch to something else. So I, I like, for me, what I'm finding is if I'm doing something that's sort of designed for creativity that doesn't have percussion so it so it really is a soundscape and, and a little bit more ambient um that is really successful for me so that's that's something i think about and then also because i'm doing it in a place where there are other people that kind of gives me a, a sense a, a little more sense of being isolated and and uh by myself so, so I, I think after you have mentioned soundscapes on this before i've tried to use them you know, kind of as work backgrounds and things like that. And didn't work for me. I wasn't, and and maybe it's because I just have a different history of listening to sound or having sound in the background and it didn't, didn't quite work. I'm guessing that the soundscape thing won't necessarily be for everyone in terms of it. I think that, that you're just finding that it helps. It can help in certain situations to stimulate creativity or help people focus. Yeah, I, I think if you look for things that are designed with that in mind and then kind of figure out what your personal taste is. So there are a lot of things that are meant to be, you know, music to read by, music for productivity, music for creativity. Start to look in there. What I found is that there are a bunch of playlists for classical music, for creativity, productivity, you know, things that are meant to be background. What I actually find is that classical music is way too interesting for for me to put in the background. So I like things that are designed to be sort of more, um, this isn't exactly right, but more of a, a drone and like spacey and ambient um, are the things that work for me. And like I said, percussion um, is is a tricky thing for me. A lot of times that won't work. So I know there are gonna be people who are gonna be very, very much the opposite, but I think you just need to experiment with it a little bit and look into some things that are more specifically designed for those purposes? Well, I I have to say that I think that (laughs) I'll bring us back briefly to the fact that we are a technology podcast and say that if there's any tool that could introduce a playlist that would have the right kind of music for doing one of these personal quarterly offsites, it would be Spotify because there are so many different types and varieties of playlists out there that you could kind of do one (laughs) <laughs> a new one every quarter and uh and and you would never finish them for a very 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 long time so for me like the the things that are in the the brian eno category of, of music really work well and i know that that really doesn't has not worked well for you so that's that's one example but but i think if you look at some of those things that so ambient not in the sense of nature sound but uh, the, the genre of ambient music and brian eno and his music for airports album being sort of the classic of that genre uh, to me is a very interesting place to start the other place I that can work for me is there there is this notion of sort of space uh, music or space ambient music and again no percussion kind of gives you a sense of expansion and emptiness uh, th- those can be useful for me for for certain settings if you're doing something else you know maybe not it's you know it's just people have different tastes in exercise music as well well, so let's talk about the results of the, the latest, or I guess maybe I should say, do you want to talk about the results of your latest offsite? And are there any results that we haven't talked about that you want to share? Yeah, so there were a couple of things, and it, I, I think there are some things in the start, continue, stop world. I think there are, uh, I'm looking at some approaches where I say there's, when you think of revenue, which was the focus of mine, that um, that's another place where I think jobs to be done comes in. So I realized that for me with revenue, there's sort of two different jobs. And so one is, is coming up with some things that 
that provides sort of a, a base income. And the other thing is that income that comes from truly interesting projects and, and other things where you take a much higher risk. And, and that was that was a great insight for me. And then it also helped me say, oh, here's some things going forward that might se- make, make sense just in terms of being cool projects that produce revenue. And Tom, I'll be sharing a few of those with you that might involve you after your vacation. So then I guess that, that sort of leads to that though. Now that you've got the results, what's the follow-up? How do you, what, is it just, you just kind of go on with the plan until the next quarterly offsite or are there's other follow-up to be had? No. So the first round of follow-up is to allow it to kind of uh, lie fallow, think about it. And then, then I, then I really do try to organize it. So for me, that that's going to involve three things. So one is that, that I do have these big post-it notes and with some of the results, I'm going to try to refine these things even more. Then I'll turn some of that into projects that will go into my OmniFocus uh, with specific to-dos. And then for me, uh, sort of like the new feature of my offsites, which is becoming the best part, is that I will run these by my daughter and she will look at them and prioritize, help me prioritize them and say, dad, here's what you need to do first, second and third. So those, that's really the follow up. And then I'll track to see how that goes and look at that at the next offsite, uh, which will probably have its own own theme as well. So it will be partly look back and, and partly something new that I'm looking back when I do that at the end of September. Well, we'll need to check back in with you and find out how that has gone. I guess last question. So let's say that um, we've got some listeners out there. This is intriguing to them. It's something they want to try. What are your best couple of tips for how to get started? Well, I think you want to look at all things. You want to start fairly small. So I think something like if you're saying I want to, you know, I love to do an offsite. Frankly, that would be like three days out and you know up in the mountains or something like that. That that realistically is not going to happen. So I would say look at something that you can do that's super convenient and maybe is like a morning, like a Saturday morning type of thing. You know, say. Can I do three hours? Is there a space like a local library, somebody else's office space, not your own, because you want to kind of really get that sense of offsite. And then some something that I would like to work on um, that I can actually put together a three hour agenda that has a beginning, a middle and an end uh, with something I want to achieve out of it. And I think if you can do that, that's great. There are a number of people who've done blog posts about what they do. So there there are some things to try. You know, one of the things you can do if you've, if you've done like personality tests and other things like that, this is a great chance to like pull those together and take a look at those because typically you don't think about them, you know, after you've taken them. So there will be a number of things like that. And if you work at a big organization, then you might take a look at how uh, offsites are done there and, and just, you know, grab some ideas that uh, would be good analogies for what you can do personally. So that those would, those would be my main tips. But like, I have tried doing a personal offsite at home, even when I'm by myself, it just doesn't work. You really have to get somewhere else. And that's why they call it an offsite. Well, Dennis, thank you very much. Um, I, in, very interesting look into the personal quarterly offsite. Folks, if you have questions, want to learn more about it, you know how to reach out to Dennis on LinkedIn, or we'll uh, make sure we leave our number, our voicemail line at the end, so maybe you can ask questions for an upcoming episode. Before we move on to our next segment, though, let's take a break for a message from our sponsors. Text Expander is a productivity multiplier. Lawyers love Text Expander because with a short abbreviation or search while typing, Text Expander can produce cover emails for invoices or signing instructions, insert templates for consistent meeting notes, perform accurate date math on the fly, and instantly present things you retype all the time. Text Expander runs on Macs, iPhones, iPads, and Windows and works in any application. Visit TextExpander.com slash podcast for 20% off your first year. Looking for a process server you can trust? 
ServeNow.com is a nationwide network of local pre-screen process servers. ServeNow works with the most professional process servers in the industry. Connecting your firm with process servers who embrace technology, have experience with high volume serves, and understand the litigation process and rules of properly effectuating service. Find a pre-screened process server today. Visit www.servenow.com. And now let's get back to the Kennedy Mile Report. I'm Tom Mile. And I'm Dennis Kennedy. Summer means vacation for many people, and vacation means, for many listeners, a great excuse to buy new travel gear, especially technology. So we always like to take a look through our travel bags each summer and share some of the things that we found that really work for us. Uh, cool travel tools, if, if you like. Tom, other than 15 new pairs of headphones, what cool travel tools do you want to highlight? Well, first of all, that's hilarious. But next, you know, as we're recording this, I'm getting ready to go on vacation myself. And you know what? I don't think I have any new travel tools that I'm taking with me. Instead, what I want to do is mention the tried and true, the trusted tools that I'm bringing, as well as a couple of tips. So I won't be bringing 15 headphones, but I've said it before, I'll say it again. If you're traveling long haul on your vacation, invest in a pair of good noise-canceling headphones. I'm partial to Bose, but there's a lot of good ones out there that cost less than Bose do. Um, but I will tell you, Bose just introduced the new noise-canceling headphone set that are getting great reviews and I'm really interested in trying out just not 15 other headphones uh, along the way. Another tip is I use my phone as my guidebook when we're traveling. So I often need to recharge a lot when we're out sightseeing because the phone can drain pretty quickly. Uh, I am using the Anchor PowerCore Speed 20,000, uh, which can recharge your iPhone or Android phone about five times on a single charge, and it charges it quickly. That's why they call it speed to, to 20,000, is it can do it really fast. So having a good charger for your phone or your mobile devices, I think is critical, especially if you're going to do a lot of sightseeing. I usually use flight and train time to catch up on TV shows that I've missed, and sometimes when there's downtime in the hotel room or wherever we're staying, want to catch up on shows that we missed. So having subscriptions to Netflix or Amazon Prime is useful. I've already downloaded some complete seasons of four to five different shows that will more than fill up the time that it takes to get from one place to the other. And when we're in the room with nothing to do and we're watching shows, I've also bringing, I've tried to find a very small Bluetooth speaker that sounds a lot better than the tinny speakers on my iPad. So I'm going with something called, I think it's called a Tribit, T-R-I-B-I-T, X Sound Go Bluetooth speaker. Um, it's it's fairly portable. It's fairly light. Um, it has great sound, um, and it's a lot better than the iPad. Um, I'm going to repeat this travel tip that you should use OneNote or Evernote to store all of your travel information. I've said it many times before, but it is one of the best things that I can do. I'm using OneNote both as our travel guide as well as the place where all of our hotel, restaurant, transportation, and other confirmations are stored. And it's nice having that peace of mind that it's always there waiting for me somewhere in the cloud. Um, and finally, if you're taking a vacation in a city where you will need to get around by public transportation, one of my perennial tips is to do a search in your phone's app store for a subway app or a public transportation app. Having an app that will instantly tell you how to get from one part of town to the other using public transportation is priceless because guidebooks won't tell you, nobody will tell you, the app will be great, and it saved us from getting lost countless times. All right, that went pretty fast, but those are my best tips for travel. Dennis, now you. So a couple things. I want to agree with you that especially when you're using the Maps features on phones, your battery will drain pretty, really quickly. And so I, I think that extra charger is important to carry. So a, a couple of things. I, and I, so one is something that you recommended to me time in the past, which I, which I mentioned a few minutes ago, and I just think is a great travel tool. And that's this Rocket Book, which is it's a notebook. It just has a few pages in it, and they're like a little bit glossy. Use a friction pen on it, 
and there's an app with it and you when you write on it you scan on it and it can save it to Dropbox it can save it to Evernote which is what I do with it you can email it to yourself and it's really simplified what I take when I travel and and reduce the weight of of what I carry so that one to me is really really attractive I echo what you say on noise cancellation I tried a flight recently that was fairly short just using uh, my AirPods and I is unbelievable to me how noisy it is it's noisy in an airplane. And it's not good quality, right? You know, so that's tough. I, I agree with you to to maybe look at. I like the Boses, but uh, you might look at cheaper alternatives because uh, if you listen to podcasts or audiobooks, the sound quality is not that important. So if you can get the noise cancellation and sacrifice sound quality a little bit, that might be a good trade-off for savings. I have something, I, I don't know the manufacturer on this, and I just, it was mentioned in Cool Tools recently as a repeat, and I use these, and they're like these little Japanese bags, and they you can see through them, and they're kind of, they're not exactly plastic, and they're not exactly mesh, uh, but they're zippered, and they're great for uh, carrying like your your cords and all of those things. So I think those little little zipper bags, about the size of sandwich bags, um, those uh, where you can see what's in them, I like those. And then sort of my best travel tip is that most of the time I just uh, only take the shoes that I'm wearing. And I bought some black walking shoes, uh, or you can also buy black uh, cross trainers. And uh, they kind of work for everything. You can you can wear them as dress shoes. You can wear them as casual shoes. You can wear them when you speak. And if you want to work out, as long as you're not you know, tied to your own specific personal running shoes or something. They're more than adequate for working out. And it just makes it a lot easier, especially for me, who always says carry a CPAP uh, machine, to not have to use extra space for another pair of shoes. So those would be my tips, Tom. So now it's time for our parting shots at one tip, website, or observation you can this, use the second this podcast ends. Tom, take it away. So I saved a final travel tip for my parting shot, and that is about using mobile data. There was a time where, um, you know, trying to get a data plan to travel internationally was painful because it was expensive and you didn't get a lot of data as part of that. And times really have changed. I know that both Verizon and AT&T offer something called the Travel Pass, but if you're traveling internationally, make sure that you have that enabled on your on your phone. What, what it does for me is, is that it allows me to take my current plan, which is unlimited data, by the way. I can take that plan with me to any of the countries that offer travel pass. And once I turn on my phone in that country, it activates the travel pass for $10 a day. I can use my regular plan for just $10 a day. And I'll tell you, it's been the best deal I've ever had because I get great service on my phone. I get the data that I want. I don't have to worry about running out. It doesn't wind up costing me three or four or five or $600 in extra data costs. Um, it is a great option. So check out your provider, whether it's at and Verizon or some other provider, see what their options are and take advantage of them because they're getting better all the time. So Tom, my tip is the uh, the Flesh Kincaid grade level report, which actually comes as part of the spell checking tools in in Office um, and uh, Microsoft Office. I I mean, and I was I was uh, talking to my class in last semester when I was talking about writing simply and ways to test that, and I said, do you guys use the grade level reporting in in the spell check tool, and Nobody was familiar with that. So I showed them how to turn that on. Um, and what happens is when you run the spell check, you'll get this uh, series of reports about your document. And it'll tell you like the number of words, characters, all these things. But down at the bottom, it has a number of things about readability. And the, the Flesh Kincaid grade level report is one of those. And so what you can tell is sort of what at what gra grade level your document is written. So in a lot of ways, I mean, there are limits, of course, but that the lower the grade level, the better. And so, uh, and the higher, so if, you're, if you have a grade level that's like 14, 
then you know you're writing at a college level, and that may not be the tone that you want. Um, a lot of legal documents get a high score, but when I'm writing, I like to have like a really solid kind of ninth grade or lower uh, level if I can get away with it. So, for example, this podcast script is at a at seventh to eighth grade level. So, I think it's a great way to simplify your writing and to check to see how you're doing it. So, it's a it's a a nice built-in tool. You just go into Spell Checker. If it's not already activated, you can kind of turn it on. And uh, just another way to say, like, how how can I better communicate at a level that my audience will understand? And so that wraps it up for this edition of the Kennedy Mile Report. Thanks for joining us on the podcast. You can find show notes for this episode at tkmreport.com. If you like what you hear, please subscribe to our podcast in iTunes or on the Legal Talk Network site, where you can find archives of all of our previous podcasts, along with transcripts of the shows. If you'd like to get in touch with us, please reach out to us on LinkedIn or leave us a voicemail. Our voicemail number is 720-441-6820. That's 720-441-6820. So until the next podcast, I'm Tom Mile. And I'm Dennis Kennedy. And you've been listening to the Kennedy Mile Report, a podcast on legal technology with an internet focus. If you like what you heard today, please rate us in Apple Podcasts. And we'll see you next time for another episode of the Kennedy Mile Report on the Legal Talk Network. Thanks for listening to the Kennedy Mile Report. Check out Dennis and Tom's book, The Lawyer's Guide to Collaboration Tools and Technologies, Smart Ways to Work Together from ABA Books or Amazon. And join us every other week for another edition of the Kennedy Mile Report, only on the Legal Talk Network.